My name is Irene Kurka and I welcome you to my podcast Neue Musik leben. This is usually a podcast that is done in German and in Germany, but sometimes I do some English episodes like today. I have started classical singing, but ended up doing lots of contemporary and experimental music and I really love it. If you would like to meet me or listen to me or hear me, please go to my website www.ierenekurka.de. I will also put this link for you in the show notes. This podcast is about themes all around new and contemporary music. I share with you behind the scenes insider knowledge and I bring you the humans of the new music, new music world closer. I'm always very touched when you write me or talk to me what those episodes has done with you. And yeah, it's always great to receive your feedback. I'm cooperating with the NMZ, that is the Neue Musikzeitung, which is really a great paper. There is a print version and an online version. Today, I have an interview for you with the wonderful composer Clara Janotta. Enjoy. Hello, I'm welcoming you, Clara. Clara Janotta here in your empty apartment <laughs> in Berlin. <laughs> Thank you so you're much. Just getting everything ready here. Welcome. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. I want to start with how did you find your way into new and experimental music? Yeah. Um, so it, I think that it was by accident somehow because I was a flutist and I just wanted to be a flutist in my life. And then one of my professors, I mean, actually my professor at that time, he told me that I had to study composition because I had to understand better what I was uh, playing. That's a great approach. I never heard yes. about that. Yeah, exactly. Cool. And then, and so that's how I start, basically. And I remember that when I, my first professor uh, in composition, he once told me, he asked me, uh, you know, you don't want to be a composer, right? And I was like, no, no, no. Okay, because you actually have uh, a problem with creativity. You don't have so much creativity. And I was like, oh, don't worry, I'm not going to be. <laughs> really? He told you that? <laughs> yes. He told oh my me God. That. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember that I told him something like, I'd rather be a musicologist. <laughs> and then if you, if you, I think a couple of years later, I just uh, stopped playing flute. And I started to just compose. I mean, it's, I think that I've, I've been experimenting my whole life creating things from scratch. My father taught me how to uh, build my own toys, etc. So it's like um, I've always had this Frankenstein toys, you know, it's like uh, taking pieces of everything and just connect them together. And uh, that was my toy. I mean, how small were you then? Or uh, he taught me when I was three. Oh. I mean, toys were not, were not allowed, I always say that. Okay. Uh, and so it's like... <gasps> Toys were not allowed, and so he taught us, me and my siblings, how to make them. And uh, I've been uh, I've been doing my toys, or anyway, everything that I thought it was a toy since I was three. And um, and I think that when I started to compose with sound, I mean, at the beginning I didn't quite know that I could do that also with sound, because I mean, from one side I didn't have experience, mm -hmm. and from the other side the music that I was uh, that I grew up with was just not that weird you know mm -hmm. and so I mean I remember that when I started to compose which I was quite I was uh, not old but anyway I was like 18 19 um, I remember that I used to write like Scriabin or you know and then at some point I met other composers and uh, and I saw that they were like preparing instruments you know I think that someone showed me cage and I was like wait can you do that And so I was like, okay, well, that's my jam. I mean, yeah. this is how I grew up with. And, uh, and ever since I started to just, uh, you know, uh, try to, to build my sounds, try to imagine sounds that don't exist and somehow make them real, uh, using pretty much everything that I would find. 
you know. So that, that was, uh, I think that, yeah, when I was pretty much 19, I started to... Um, And so you still build instruments? Oh, nowadays? yes, the whole yes. time. All time? The whole time. Great. What I can't do, I asked to some engineers. So, for example, I worked for about three projects now with uh, a Berlin-based um, engineer, uh, I mean, visual artist engineer called Jan Bernstein, and he builds uh, everything that has motors. Um, so it's... Uh, I, I really like to build things. Great. Yeah. And it's interesting because, I mean, the instrument you build or the toys, I mean, you can really touch them, but yes. the music you cannot touch. I mean, it's Exactly. Just... Well, you just have to... Um, I mean, I, it's, it's, sub, it's such an abstract realm, the sound, that somehow building an instrument, it concretizes a tiny bit more. And mm -hmm. it's almost like I can talk in a better way. About, I can visualize it, you know. I really can see it three-dimensionally <laughs> and not just in my head. And I think that probably one of the reasons why I do uh, build it, knowing that in any case, that instrument that I'm going to build is going to be just part of that sound. It's not going to be that whole sound that is in my head. It's part of it, but somehow it just helps me to visualize what I mean, this abstract realm that sound is, you know. What represents good new music for you? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, I don't know. It's like it's... Um, okay, from one side, music is good for me in the sense that I, uh, I cope with reality in a better way. It's like it's my way of almost uh, um, analyzing myself, understanding myself. Um, and that's why one of the uh, what happens to me when I write is that I really get um, very very sad, you know, because it's uh, it's almost like this inside mirror. And mm -hmm. I mean, at least this is how I I uh, experience music and uh, the way I mean the writing experience, you know, composing. And when you listen to it, does it also mirror something in you? When you listen to it, it's even worse sometimes because okay. it really shows things of yourself. I mean, I think that is it's pretty much the whole process, composing and then hearing it. It's like when you hear it, you're naked, completely mm -hmm. naked. And the thing is that you are sharing with the rest of the people your darkness. Okay. Or at least for me, it's my darkness. I, it, it's, I remember... When I was younger, that music was just playful, you know, like writing a piece was just this, oh my God, I'm going to make just this, not game, but anyway, it's going to be playful and sparkling and joyful. And then at some point I was like, I mean, why should I even lie? I mean, there's just darkness, just mm -hmm. let's deal with darkness. And uh, But I mean, it's um, sometimes, it's, it's hard, not just for me. I mean, I had people that... Uh, were talking to me after concerts and saying um, I really didn't feel comfortable on my seat and I was like good you should not I, okay. I really think that you should not you know I mean I, I my my goal is actually I want that you you feel it okay <laughs> you know? no. but I, I mean this is like what is um, my personal experience mm -hmm. with music but if I if I think about like the social aspect of new music that's really hard I mean, it's really, really hard nowadays to me. Um, it's such a, a close uh, community and uh, uh, mostly white male community. I mean, it's 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 hard because it's. I feel that sometimes it's really close. Mm -hmm. It's too judgmental. Is uh, is uh, we have such. Uh, it's too privileged. And we really should try to open it a tiny bit more. But it's really hard. It's really But you hard. But you're doing it. Yeah, I'm doing it in my own own very small reality. But um, institutions should just join and uh, and and do their job, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about music and above all new music, um, most I mean it's one of the. I mean, everybody is super high educated, you know, it's like you do all this path, educational path from, uh, you, you get your bachelor, master, PhD, postdoc, so it's super highly educated, which means that in order to just, I mean, this is what I think, but I think that in order to 
change something about this community, you have to change the institutions mm-hmm. that uh, that bring you to the to where you are. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so I think that uh, there's a lot to do yes. in this, and I hope, I really hope uh, that this will change. Okay, I understand. But it's hard. I mean, I see it. I mean, uh, uh, since last year, I started to do also job interviews in order to teach. And I do see that uh, uh, mostly who gets the job are men. Okay. And I just don't get it. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I mean, I actually do get it. But uh, I think that uh, a jury have to change. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. like people have to start to put into ju- in juries... Uh, uh, people that can actually change the yes, things, yes. you know. It's okay. uh, so I really hope that this will change. Great, I hope that too. <laughs> that you are like a pioneer. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm really not. I think so too. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just <laughs> joining the resistance. <laughs> okay. What are the qualities you most appreciate in the performers you work with? The performers, uh, when they are open-minded, when they trust you, no matter what. You know, uh, because I mean, you know, it happened to me that I've worked with musicians that were very resistant at the beginning. Somehow, I mean, actually, most of the time this happens to me. It's like the first rehearsals that I have, they treat me so badly. And I mean, I get it. I have long hair and um, I don't know. I don't get it actually, but anyway, it's like it takes a tiny bit of time for them to trust me, and then after a couple of rehearsals, when they do understand that I know what I wrote, I know those sounds, I can sing my whole pieces, I can show you every sound I I wrote, and I can hear it, uh, then somehow there is a trust that is established, and uh, and 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 then something goes on pretty well. Not every time, but so I mean I would. I would have. I would love to meet uh, performers, and I I do know performers like this, of course, that they trust you right away. You know, mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. mean, uh, um, and it does happen. Like uh, Jack, you know, the mm-hmm. the string quartet Jack. They are some of the uh, most amazing uh, musicians that I've seen. Uh, I've seen them performing pieces from students quite a lot of times, and the way the seriousness with which they just approach to their music, knowing that these these are just students. They are still completely unknown and maybe the piece is terrible, but the seriousness with which they just take care of each sound is something that it just makes me love this job, (laughs) you know. So I think that, yeah, probably trust is, is, is what I appreciate the most from performers. Amazing, but I mean, you already know how to handle it when it first uh, is a yeah. little bit rough, and yeah. you stick to it. And but it's frustrating, yeah, you know. It is very, very frustrating. I mean, I've recently worked with an orchestra, and uh, um, um, I mean, it just you you lose so much confidence. Okay. You know, you go home and you feel so bad. <laughs> Uh, and uh, also you have I mean do I have to uh, I mean even if the music doesn't convince you perfectly as a performer you have to defend it you know and I do understand that it is quite a hard job because you have to play so much music that you don't like (laughs) and you would rather not play Uh, but that is also part of your job Mm -hmm. and the fact that I come there and you don't know me and so you assume that uh, my music is shit. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just, uh, it, it, it's really, really frustrating. And then you get home and you feel so bad. Mm-hmm. And uh, and these are things that I would, I, would, I mean, I, I've experienced them so many times and I'm 36 now. And I think that I proved myself so yes. much, you know, in this, uh, in this job. And I still have to prove myself. And I talked with... Uh, Uh, much older composers that I admire a lot. I, I was talking with Haya Chernowin, mm-hmm. which has been my professor and a mentor and a friend. Mm-hmm. And I told her, like, I asked her, like, how many times do I have to prove myself? And she said, your whole life. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, But is it also then a solution? I mean, 
to work with people again who already have the trust with you and then you're like yeah. oh my god they're so amazing like this quartet you told me and then yeah yeah no that that's a, that's that is absolutely exciting yeah. that is absolutely exciting because But i i also like that as a as a as a performer i mean there there are some composers where it's really like a great match and then i also go back of course because it's just wonderful and with With each experience or new piece, you you even go deeper because you already have so much understanding for each other. Yes. And oh yeah, absolutely. I really love that. I would like to know because I know that you actually haven't written anything yet for voice, which yes. um, is sad for me. But <laughs> how did it come to that? Or will that ever change? Or well, I mean, I did. Um, so there are two pieces that I actually. I mean, I'm, I'm, I would not say voice because, I mean, it depends on what we um, think about what voice is. I mm -hmm. mean, it's like I did write for, for example, for Noyo Vocal Solistin, but they almost didn't sing. Mm -hmm. um, voice is just, I think that I still didn't find that how I can uh, um, project these sounds that I have in my mind to the voice itself. I think that it's uh, it's very malleable as an instrument, let's say, but I still uh, don't feel that I am uh, ready to write for them, you know. Um, it will come, maybe, I don't know. It's like I have to, I, I have to think about it, but maybe just because, you know, you have to choose a text, you have to do all these kind of things, and uh, it's, uh, it's, I think that I'm just not ready yet. But the people have been asking mm -hmm. me. and uh, I, One person even asked about an opera, and I was like, no, 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 okay. no, 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 not, not yet. It's <laughs> good that you feel what, what you can do and what really fits to you. I mean, that's, yes. um, I think, a great quality then to just do it and then maybe not be happy or, or feel, oh, my God, this... Or yes, exactly. Mistake or something. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. How do your friends, family, colleagues, and audiences react to the sort of music you make, and how do you deal with their reaction? <laughs> um, okay, my family. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, my father. So my parents never came to any concert except for one. My father came actually in Paris when I did my master's degree. And he knows what I do. It's mm -hmm. like sometimes he just says like, hey, Clara, Clara, listen to this noise. Maybe you want to put it in your next piece. Um, but somehow he still doesn't get it. So, for example, he keeps asking whether I can uh, write a song for his church, a Christmas song mm -hmm. for his church. And I told oh. him so many times, <laughs> Dad, if I do that, you will never... You will not be allowed anymore to get inside that church, you know. <laughs> uh, and um, I remember one episode in which uh, I think last year it happened. So my father, I came back home. I went to Rome to visit my families. And then my father was eating in the kitchen. And I got inside the kitchen and there was my CD playing. My father was playing my CD. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I was like, wait, what? I, I do know this music. And in order to get inside the kitchen, I had to open the door which communicates with the living room in which my mother was. My mm -hmm. mother was uh, watching TV. And so I opened the door. I realized that the music was playing was mine. And I heard my mother screaming to my father, can you stop that shit? <gasps> <laughs> and me and my father, we started to laugh because... <laughs> <laughs> Um, my sister, I mean, my, my sister, actually, I collaborated with my sister quite a bit. Uh, she's a dancer. She likes what okay, I do. Good. My friends, it depends. I mean, it's, um, they, they think that I write, um, creepy things. I mean, this year that I've been in Rome, I love coffee and I found this amazing coffee shop where um, I went every day. And so at some point I started to be friend with the... Yeah with the bartenders and uh, they asked me, okay, what's your name? What you do? And I was like, well, I'm a composer. And they were like, oh my God, what you write? And I was like, I mean, <laughs> weird things. But if I put you on Spotify, do I find you? And I, do I find you? And I was like, yeah. But, and then they went and they were like, oh my God, I'm going to this. And I was like, ah, be right. And um, we never talked about the music. <laughs> 
you've got your great coffee. <laughs> yeah, and this is actually what I told them. I was like, look, do whatever you want. Just give me the coffee every morning, <laughs> no matter what you think about my music, you know. <laughs> it's fine. I mean, some, they say like this like horror film, and I'm flattered. So, okay. Um, I mean, I always tell them I write noise, so it's mm -hmm. and um, yeah. So you're cool, but obviously there are also people who really support you. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think there are prejudices against new music? And if so, how do you want to see things change? And what are you doing to help and bring things in, in the change of the attitude? Um, I think the people outside the new music field are biased as well as we are. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that we are even closer than the audience that doesn't know like that has prejudice about new music is I mean of course it's like there are people that um, uh, they think somehow that new music is uh, Webern and Schoenberg that is still that you know and uh, and I mean many times I've had uh, for example I remember um, going to a concert at Harvard in which Okun Lee uh, this unbelievable cellist was playing and she's very very known as uh, in, in jazz you know and, oh, I mean, okay. although she's an experimentalist and such um, and I remember that there was a big audience really really big and she was playing and that was the first time that I actually encountered um, I mean her playing and the audience went insane like insane they loved her and then I was like thinking If you love that, you will love our music too, you know, because it's uh, that's the kind of uh, that's kind of what we do. Uh, and so I think that um, a lot of audience doesn't know what we do. Mm -hmm. I mean, but it's our fault mm. because somehow I think that the new music community really closed itself. Uh, it's almost like, oh, we want to be elitist, you know. Mm -hmm. We want that the people are super high educated. Uh, oh, pop music, I don't listen to that thing. Uh, I mean, come on. Uh, I think that, first of all, we should listen to pop music. There is so much that we can learn from mm -hmm. it. Um, and I think, as, as I said already, it's like we really should try to open much more. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, we lost the mainstream that the new music was because of us. I mean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of course, society has evolved and changed and uh, uh, other needs uh, uh, started to be important for people, etc. But I think that um, the new music community has to change. Yep. We have to be more open. We have to be able to... Uh, accept and also just you know but I think that the new generation does it I mean mm -hmm. uh, I've seen uh, I've been in many juries and uh, I'm meeting a lot of young composers and, and I see that this is what they are doing now and uh, so I don't know maybe in 20 years it'll change when okay. all the old I people hope die go faster. <laughs> <laughs> oh me too hopefully hopefully yeah, yeah, hopefully, yeah. yeah. cool um, so now you are the artistic director of the Blue Dancer Target Site Gemessa Musik. Yes. But from 2014 to 2020? Yes. So what does curating mean for you and how do you do it? Uh, um, well, it's, it's, it's something that happened by chance. Uh, Alexander Mosburger, which was the artistic director before me, mm -hmm. he called me saying, look, I mean, uh, a friend composer uh, gave me your name so that I could give you a commission for the Blue Dancer Tiger. And uh, I really liked the music that you write. And I thought, why don't you just curate it? And I was like, what? Wow. <laughs> and I was like, of course. Um, at the beginning, really honestly, I just took the music that uh, I liked. Mm -hmm. I chose the composers I liked. Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I was like, let me just, you know, uh, I want to put together almost like a playlist, mm -hmm. you know, of the pieces I love and I mm -hmm. want to hear them live, you know. And, uh, and then uh, I started to just realize that actually it's, uh, it's a very important job and it's, uh, the responsibility that you have is, is, is really huge because... Uh, 
curators create the scene. They mm-hmm. create the brands. You know, yes. it's like they create what what is going on. We give the platform to mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, to artists, and mm-hmm. so it's almost us that create the scene, the new music scene. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, you have to treat this job uh, in the most responsible way. Um, and so that's why I've been very vocal about uh, um, gender, about um, the fact that it's the... I mean, when you have a festival, no matter how big it is, of course, I mean, my bludens is, is pretty small. Uh, but I think that uh, it's uh, curating is not just... Uh, a huge festival, a small festival is also a concert. Is also the choice that you make when you, as professor, bring pieces to analyze inside your class. Uh, it's also when uh, someone asks you who are your favorite composers, and you mention someone. You know, as an almost like as an education, a pedagogical mm-hmm, mm-hmm. thing. And uh, I think it's um, the way it is done now. Uh, many times I say that is not responsible enough. And so I do my job, I, I try to um, to give to Bludens the vision that I have of what my community, or at least like the hopes that I have for my community. Uh, it's not perfect yet because also my judgment is not perfect and I'm trying to work on it and... Uh, um, but uh, yes, I mean, for me, curating is it's something that I really love. It's, it's uh, time consuming because I wake up every day and one of the things that I try to do pretty much every day or at least uh, most of the days is to listen to music. To, oh, how nice. Oh, I mean, of course, that's the only way. It's like you go on SoundCloud, you go, someone uh, posts something, etc., and I listen to that and... Uh, and sometimes you find people that you didn't know before, you know. It's not... Because the problem that I see is that uh, many um, artistic directors, and probably also because, you know, I had received so many emails mm-hmm. as, as uh, a Bluden's mm-hmm. uh, artistic director. Imagine how many emails mm-hmm. uh, f- as, if a bigger festival yeah. or a more known festival mm-hmm. can receive. I mean, I hardly deal with all of them because it's really a lot sometimes. It's overwhelming imagine these people. But I don't think that it's good that a curator only goes to concerts and that's how they pick, you know, mm. uh, their lineup for the festival. They have to listen. Uh, they should have advisors. Mm-hmm. I really think that the one person curator is just so no, no, it's, it's not okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, curating to me is is something that brought me a lot. The most, the thing that it was the most important for me about being a curator, it was um, how much awareness of um, how terrible this new music community is. Uh, it really showed me that, and uh, and uh, I tried to do my best. Sometimes it's not enough, but uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much about telling me how you curate and how, how serious you take that. I really like that, and you already kind of passed my next question. What is your approach to time management and do you have any advice for the rest of us? Do you have rituals or how you say you listen every day to music? Uh, oh my God, advice? No, really. I mean, I get the, my daily routine is pretty boring. It's like wake up at five, I do breakfast and read newspapers and then I just work as much as I can. Normally it's like the first four or five hours of the day are the most productive for me. And, uh, and then it starts to go a bit downhill. Um, I listen every day. I think about one to two hours of music. Um, and then I read a lot. I watch a lot of series. I really like that. <laughs> <laughs> I run uh, a lot. Also. I do a lot of sport and I love to just walk. So this is pretty much what I do. Okay. Yeah. So it's... Uh, Advice, I don't have it. I mean, it's, uh, it's, I, I don't have it. I mean, what I would say is just um, write something and then let it, you know, s- sleep on it. Mm-hmm. And then the day after you wake up, we understand that maybe you have to rewrite it completely. Uh, yeah, I don't have advice. I mean, actually, if people have advice for me, I would take them. Okay, right. It sounds like you have it pretty much lined up your day and yes. your routines and so for you it works 
It does well. work. It does work pretty well. Yeah. What are you thankful for today? Oof. Well, so many things. I mean, it's like I do the job that I like. Um, I. I mean, it's pretty insane if I think about it. You know that uh, I know how difficult this job is. So I know so many people that either they don't have commissions or it is just difficult to um, make your life, you know, out of it. And uh, the fact that I can do it, that uh, it just, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I feel very extremely privileged. So I'm very thankful for that. And I'm very, very, very extremely thankful for, for Blue Dance, mm -hmm. for all it taught me. For the fact that they trusted me without knowing me, and now it has been um, six years that I do it, and uh, they still want me, <laughs> and um, and I have all the support, you know. And it, it really, it's this is what is great is that I mean I when I was in Paris. Um, 2011, I had a concert, um, and uh, Josephine Markovitz came. She's the, she was the the artistic director of um, the Festival du Tonne in Paris, and um, I mean, she listened just to one piece of mine. She was like, you know what? I'm giving you a commission for the Festival du Tonne. Let's cool. try this. Let's try this. You know, and and this somehow started this whole thing because then I got the day I did and one thing mm. uh, called the other and um, I just wish there were more people like that you know mm -hmm. you don't need always the same names in your mm -hmm. festival you have but in order to do that you really have to go and try to find and sometimes you do find these people in a conservatorist concert mm -hmm. <laughs> you know in which they are just um, kids um, doing their uh, experimental pieces mm -hmm. yeah so I'm, I'm extremely thankful for that who or what has played the greatest role in shaping you and what inspires you oh that's hard I mean it's um, because this changed of course uh, during the years um, I mean it's like as I said it's like the, the people that gave me the opportunities of course And then there are some uh, other people that uh, inspired me somehow in a way that... Uh, like, for example, if I think about Dorothy Molloy, which is this uh, writer, this Irish writer that I discovered in 2014, that it was a very difficult year for me because uh, um, somehow I was having panic attacks that mm. I never had in my life, but like pretty bad ones that I had to go mm. to, to the emergency right away. Um, and uh, it's almost like I realized that you could die, you know, and you just have these panic attacks. And then uh, what happened is that uh, the way I am is that when I fear something, I try to read everything about it, you know. And so when I started to read about death and uh, experiencing death, etc., I, I, I came across Dorothy Muller, which actually was suggested, um, my partner suggested me to read her. And uh, uh, I mean, she's an, unbe an unbelievable writer. I mean, she wrote these four small collections of poems in which she um, talks about death and her her body just her watching her body disintegrating because she was having cancer and most of the time she would write while she was having treatments chemotherapy etc and uh, it touched me so much I, I, I think that he really shaped uh, the artist that I am today or like even the person that I am today it's like ever since in 2014 I started to use always her words for titles but not just titles it's like it really gave me the, the inspiration. It's like she always gives me these images and then from the images that she gives me I can just um, try to find the sonic visualization of these images. So I think that she was definitely mm. one of the biggest inspiration of my life. David Foster Wallace, mm -hmm. Italo Calvino, the way they treat temporality and... Uh, It's pretty unbelievable. Chris Cunningham, which is a, a video maker, um, 
it's uh, the the way he uses so i think that i mean of course there are composers um uh, that uh that I mean, Haya Chernowin has definitely be one of mm-hmm. the most important figures in my life. Above all, because when I met her, uh, when I started to study with her in 2014 at Harvard, I had the biggest crisis of my life. Mm-hmm. For one year, I could not write, and she's one of the uh, reasons why I got out of that crisis. Great, she, was, she Great. really helped me. So Super. I think that all these people kind of inspired me and made me. I mean, they made me grow. So what does it mean for you to be true to yourself or authentic in this music business and how do you keep true to yourself? Oof. Oof. That's... <laughs> uh, this is really hard. Uh, true to myself? I don't even know if I am truthful or authentic. It's like... Uh, I don't know. It's I, I, I don't... I, It's super, it's super hard. It's like, um, I, yeah, it's really, really hard to, to respond to this question. Um, I try, I would not say uh, truth or uh, authenticity. I probably say I, what I try to be is as honest as I can to myself. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I'm authentic, I'm probably not. Truthful, nah, I lie a lot, so it's okay. not uh, <laughs> to myself above all. Uh, so I don't think so. But I, I try to be honest in the sense that um, I try to give you my all. Sometimes it's uh, sometimes I fail, which I think that is uh, is fantastic mm-hmm. when it happens. I mean the the real memories that I have that I keep in my heart you know are above all the moments in which I fail the most okay. they really taught me so much so I try to be honest I have to say mm-hmm. but um, working as hard as I can trying to uh, trying to still learn as much as I can mm-hmm. trying to document myself trying to but I mean uh, It's like you know, originality, identity. It's it's so hard. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's so hard. Yeah. I mean, it's always a process, and if you were as honest as possible to yourself, then I think you are pretty close. <laughs> yes. Well, yes. At the same time, it's like I don't know if I even I, I am honest. I mean, I don't know. It's like I don't know. It's like you know. I I know that it sounds stupid. Uh, said by a privileged person like I am uh, but life is pretty hard mm-hmm. this job is pretty mm-hmm. hard because of all the judgment because of all the um, you know the the loss of confidence that uh, um, you have to deal with every single time something happens you don't get a job you lose confidence if you if you don't get the job Be for the wrong reasons, <laughs> you lose a lot of confidence. Mm-hmm. You write a piece that you're not happy with, you lose confidence. And there is, so it's not just the loss of confidence, but all this judgment that is around. So it's, it's, it's really hard, okay? And people have expectations and you fail them sometimes. Because, okay, I wrote a bad piece. Okay, so, I mean, it's fine. I wrote some mm-hmm. good pieces too, yeah. you know? <laughs> But you have some inner thre- strength to keep going. I mean, even if things... And otherwise, what do I do? Yeah. I mean, look, in but my... But I think some people give them really up and you're like, okay, this was shit, but I get up again or they didn't treat me nicely, I get up again. And that's I think a that real I can... inner strength. Well, not really. I th- yes, but at the same time, I can get up again because there are still people that support me because I am privileged enough okay. to, that, that around me I have so many a lot of network you mm-hmm. know it's like there are all these artistic directors that know me all these composers that know me all these students that know me now so I can keep going if I write a bad piece I will have another commission mm-hmm. but there are so many other composers that don't okay. so it's really something that I mean I am living uh, because of uh, how privileged mm-hmm, I've been mm-hmm. and I know that there are so many other composers that are as good as I am even better that uh, they just weren't uh, as lucky as I am so I don't know it's um it's really hard mm-hmm. um then I mean at the same time what what the hell do I do otherwise mm-hmm. I'm 36 <laughs> <laughs> 
in my in my dreams, I mean, because I got so interested about coffee, <laughs> I said this to some friends. I am going to have some uh, some. I'm taking some classes about coffee. I really would cool. like to <laughs> to explore more. And I was even saying to my partner last uh, last time I was saying, what would be great for me is that for two months in a year I stop composing and I just work in a coffee shop. Aww. That's like one of the dreams that I have. <laughs> <laughs> but ask me next year, maybe next year I have another one. <laughs> Or you will have a cool coffee place where you can play contemporary music. No, not contemporary oh. music. <laughs> Just pop music is fine. Okay. No, 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 not contemporary. Above all, not contemporary. Why do we have to? No, no, no. <laughs> It's fine. Also not music, you know, okay. just a very quiet, nice place with a little terrace in which you can just stop thinking, mm -hmm. you know, and you just experience the magic flavor that a coffee can give. Great. <laughs> What does success mean for you? Oof. That's actually a great question. Um, I think that it just means another privilege. <laughs> No, I think that it's, um, it's uh, I mean, if I remember, I mean, I chose to be a musician when I was six, okay? And I started to play the flute. I told my mother, I want to play this and I want to be a flutist. Then at some point in my life, I mean, I didn't manage to become a flutist, like a, a I didn't manage to like win competitions or like playing the best orchestras, etc. Uh, so that dream somehow, oh, well, well put in, was put in a standby because I decided then to become a composer when I just got bored about playing flute. But somehow when I started to, to compose, I didn't even think that I could do it as an actual job. You know, I mean, I always thought, um, yeah, I mean, I would probably teach or whatever. Mm -hmm. At some point I would just change and... Uh, And I mean, I can live my life just composing and uh, I travel the whole time. I meet people, people recognize me. Um, now I also get to choose which kind of projects I want to realize, which is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And artistic directors trust, trust my visions, uh, musicians trust what I do. So um, I think that somehow this is what success means it means that uh, you have the freedom of, uh, of 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 really choosing what you want to do you're not uh, linked anymore to do what someone else mm -hmm. uh, asks you to do you choose you know um and uh and and i hope I mean, I have to say that my real hope at the the real success for me would be if I managed to make the actual change that I want to make, to to see that uh, to see this new music community changing. This is really what success would mean to me, and I think that this is the path I have to do because. Mm -hmm. When people start to trust you, when you say something and people are listening, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, oh, okay, so wait a second. Then maybe if I tell this person this, so I mean, it happened to me, for example, that um, some artistic directors of ensembles, they were like, uh, uh, so Clara, when we are doing this next season, etc., Uh, what do you think? And I say like, oh, it's great. I mean, look, uh, you have, you are playing like 95% uh, white men. I mean, maybe you can do something about it. And then I see that the next season they start to change. Oh. And, uh, and uh, I, I mean, it's not just because I say it, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, I mean, uh, probably I am one of the many people mm -hmm. that say it. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think that these things change. So it's, I think that, Yeah, success is probably the mm -hmm. freedom that you have to say things that also people sometimes they don't like, but somehow they can't mm. get mad at you, you know, because it's not like you're famous, but anyways, like, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might already have answered it. What drives you forward? Do you have a vision? <laughs> yeah, the vision, as I said, is 
to have uh, I think that you know it's I just hope that I will keep uh, discovering new things you know the things that makes me that make me excited I mean I have these projects with this artist that I absolutely love as artist as human being which is Eva Alonso which is a light designer mm. and um, so together with her we have been uh, um, making installations and trying to really create this uh, a sonic visual experience and and this is something that uh, I really love so I would I would just love to keep going and and I have to say that last year I worked with film with uh, Peter Tchaikovsky um, because of this commission uh, given from Darmstadt uh, uh, which was fantastic and I had to do the soundtrack of his a short film out of space and um, it was really a revealing experience to me so I'd love to write soundtracks for horror films okay just horror film I don't care about films horror films oh my god I okay. got really really <laughs> obsessed <laughs> okay we arrived at the last question <laughs> which tip would you like to give young artists Ooh. Um, hmm. a tip um, probably well I mean it's saying like this I feel like an old grandma saying like be honest to yourself but it's like just just do what you want if people don't like it they fuck it just <laughs> Just do what you want. Don't think about pleasing other people. Because I don't think the music should please other people. You have to do it for yourself. People will join. <laughs> And if they don't right away, okay, whatever. They will join a tiny bit later. But, uh, but do it for yourself. And above all, music, I mean, is not just composing sounds. It's being part of a community And we have to be, we have to read, we have to document ourselves, we have to uh, give a contribution, not just sonically to this community, but also um, in, in a more human way. And we have to be open as much as I can, I think, uh, to um, all the other kind of music, uh, even the, the, the music that we do not understand right away, which is what new music is for most of people that are not uh, in our field. Um, and I think that, yeah, probably just yeah, be as open as you can and, and don't write for other people, just for yourself. Well, thank you very much thank for you so taking much. all this time with me. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> my pleasure. This was the interview with Clara Janotta. And I really hope that she could inspire you And I'm looking forward to all your ideas and feedbacks through email or Facebook. Thank you so much that you tuned in today to my show. I hope that you liked it and it inspired you. And I would be so happy if you could tell your friends and your colleagues about this podcast. Or if you could take some time to give this podcast a good evaluation on iTunes. Thank you. I wish you all the best. Live your music, live your life and see you next time. Yours, Irene. <laughs>